Philip, I think we can start now. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome, everyone, back to the Digital Consulting and PhD Program platform. The platform is a brand new addition to our international doctoral program at DigiFutures. As we are experiencing uh, paradigm shifts uh, to our education model, we envision the Digital Futures community to become an increasing increase, uh, inclusive and expansive one. And thus, we think this year Digital Futures events around inclusive futures. The Digital Consortium PhD pro program follows the same line of thought to be a free and open platform accessible for all corners of the world. Instead of having students assigned to individual professors in uh, individual classrooms, we may have a single global classroom online with a platform. And this form of global knowledge collective or global brain, whereby everyone can share their thoughts and the visions. I thank a lot for all the professors, expertise, theorists, and the practitioners coming to join us to teach on this platform and make this vision come true. The platform is divided in several uh, sequence of lectures and discussions. And new is here. In the past uh, two weeks, actually New Reach um, already organized two special uh, sequence, one on architecture and philosophy. And Zizak make um, uh, extremely um, fantastic opening speech for the whole event. And uh, the past sequence is about the guide to AI. I think it's also attractive to all the students and the young generation. And tonight, from today, we kick off another sequence. We name uh, it as performance-based uh, digital design methodology. It's a fantastic uh, group of people we invited uh, from all over the world uh, who play the leadership in different labs and give a uh, uh, a global influence in the past few years. So our first guest uh, today, we invite Areti uh, Macapolo. Areti is an architect, researcher, and educator from Greece. She is now uh, uh, holding the position of academic director at IAC in Barcelona. IAC, everyone uh, in our research field uh, heard about the name. They play a very important role and make a lot of experimental research and organize extremely interesting events in the past few years. And uh, as well as leading the advanced um, architecture group, um, um, Areti also um, uh, uh, organized the interdisciplinary research on, uh, to explore uh, the, the positive effect design and science uh, on the now and the future of the built environment. I think um, we met um, several times in Europe and uh, um, Arati have a very big influence, not only in Europe, but also in China as well. So um, in the past four, a few sequence, we have more than um, 1,000, sometimes thousands of audience uh, participate to join this event from um, the Bidi Bidi Alive and also YouTube. So I hope um, this open uh, source platform can produce a new understanding uh, uh, on the new knowledge. So thanks a lot uh, for Arati to give a, a lecture today. So welcome, Arati. Uh, thank you, Philippe, uh, for the invitation. Thank you, Neil, as well. Hello. Um, I think that um, before starting with my talk, just to say that I'm really glad I am part of these conversations. Um, and I'm really glad that I am part of this initiative. I think that there is no doubt that we need to um, reimagine and reorganize our educational models and formats, um, the digital acceleration of um, uh, the pandemic uh, so does that we need to rethink the way that we connect people in terms of education. So it's a really great initiative, the one that you are setting up. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that I can participate to that. So I will start by um, uh, sharing my presentation. I hope that, um, let me minimize my windows. 
so that you can only see um, Um, as uh, Philippe said, um, I'm the academic director at IAC, uh, the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, based in Barcelona. And um, IAC is a very, very um, a multidisciplinary space of uh, thought and action. Um, we are focused on developing novel solutions for the habitability of the cities uh, of the present and the future. And we are doing so by basically designing, um, combining design with science so that we can have a positive impact uh, in our environment and our society. So um, these are some of the images of our facilities. We have a series of different laboratories and we are of course based um, in Barcelona, which is uh, in a way, um, the city that have invented the idea of urbanization, the city that have invented urbanism. Um, and of course, it is a city that it's very, very rich in terms of um, uh, creative practices, uh, design and innovation. So we are, we are glad that we can operate um, from the center of Barcelona uh, to Europe and to the rest of the world. Um, very quickly before getting into my talk, I wanted to showcase a bit our facilities, um, mainly because the facilities are also part of, um, uh, let's say, the, um, the pedagogical uh, process that we are using at IAG. We are very much uh, based on learning by doing. Um, we combine design with uh, making, prototyping and fabrication. We always want to test our uh, novel ideas outside of the laboratory. We use the city as the laboratory itself. And therefore, um, on the one hand, we collaborate with uh, industry. But on the other hand, um, we are a place uh, that we um, work in a series of uh, European funded projects. We're actually running almost 20 European funded projects uh, from the European Commission, that the goal of this project is um, um, to fund research in order to develop um, novel pilot projects about different topics such as urban generation or circular design and construction. So in a way, um, um, there is a kind of a very strong um, a partnership that is being created in uh, each one of these projects, including, uh, of course, academies, um, uh, research institutes, but also uh, industries and city administrations, which is very, very important uh, because it's the only way to make pilot projects that cities could um, potentially evaluate and then uh, eventually change certain regulations that we know that um, um, in the construction sector um, is something very, very difficult to change, which is why also um, our discipline um, and this uh, sector is very, very slow in adapting innovation. So um, apart from, um, let's say, um, this uh, um, goal that we have to test as much as possible to materialize our, our ideas, into pilot projects. We are um, starting by using these facilities. We have uh, uh, in the heart of Barcelona, um, a 2,200 square meter of space. As you can see in the images, um, students can play with uh, a digital fabrication machines, but they can also um, make, get their hands dirty with different materials and prototype their ideas. Um, the school doesn't look like a traditional school with sterilized classrooms, um, but it's a kind of a very, very um, um, hands-on, um, let's say, atmosphere that you can feel in the building. is a is a former ceramics factory that we have uh, renovated, um, and today is. Uh, uh, transformed in what we call a factory of ideas and projects. So this is in Pobleno. Um, we, we have um, uh, a Fab Lab, the Fab Lab Barcelona, which is one of the first Fab Labs uh, in Europe and the largest one in Europe. Um, uh, it's a laboratory that apart from, uh, let's say, serving certain uh, um, uh, students' projects, 
it also has uh, a mission, a more social mission towards the community in order to be able to integrate uh, people that they are not necessarily experts in design. So Fab Lab Barcelona operates a lot with uh, workshops and activities that engage um, 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 from children to elderly people, uh, to people with special needs and, and actually giving them access to technology in order to materialize their ideas and in order to question the model of um, uh, buying from the self what you need. No, we are actually helping them to produce what they need and to be part of, 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 of that in a creative process. Um, then we have a second building in the center of uh, Barcelona, just across the main uh, building, our IAC Atelier, which is uh, um, an almost 1,000 square meters uh, space. It's an open space distribution where different students from different master programs come together in order to work um, on their research and on their projects, um, as well as using um, uh, um, a second fabrication laboratory, the master lab, that it is equipped with um, um, full access to milling, laser cutting uh, equipment, 3D printing, robotic arms, uh, drone labs, uh, biomatter laboratory. We have a VR and AR lab as well. And of course, an electronics lab so that um, uh, um, students and researchers can, can work on, on uh, um, on let's say um, different details of embedding intelligence into what they are producing with the fabrication equipment. Um, as a third building and as a third let's say campus we have uh, the Valdaura campus which is an amazing amazing uh, house in the middle of the forest. It is just 20 minutes driving from um, Barcelona um, but it is inside a natural park, the Colserola Natural Park, surrounded by 140 hectares of forest. And uh, this um, uh, campus is actually a testing ground for innovat innovative ideas in relation to self-sufficiency. So within that campus, we have set up um, three laboratories, um, an energy lab, a, a, a green fab lab, and a food lab so that we can produce locally almost everything that we need to consume from food to resources such as energy or even to create our own products and designs uh, within the fab lab. Now um, my contribution for uh, today's uh, um, uh, talk uh, is um, uh, certain principles and applications and reflections as well on uh, materializing circular design. Uh, of course, through the use of computation and fabrication. At IAC, as I was saying in the beginning, we're trying always to test uh, the potential of new technologies so that we can have um, a global impact um, in the way that the building industry uh, impacts the society and impacts um, uh, the environment. So um, one of the main research agendas that we're working on uh, is the circular economy, the circular design um, uh, that empowers community on the one hand and um, uh, rethinks the impact um, on the environment on the other hand. So <clears throat> if we think um, that um, um, the engineering and the construction industry is the world's largest consumer um, of raw materials, um, we can then uh, understand that circularity is important, but uh, uh, the construction industry um, is the major, uh, let's say, raw materials extraction industry, and it consumes more than 3 billion uh, tons of raw materials annually. At the same time, um, concrete is the most consumed material, uh, second only to water, actually with three tons per year used for every person in the world. So the second most widely used substance in earth is coming from construction and it is concrete. While we know that it is also the most destructive material on earth in terms of CO2 emissions, as well as in terms of um, natural resources that they are required uh, to be extracted for creating uh, concrete. And then some of you probably know those, these data um, um, 
is not new, um, but uh, it helps us to uh, position the framework of the work that we're doing. And you probably know that the building sector is one of the world's uh, largest waste generators. Construction and demolition waste accounts for approximately 30% of all waste generated in the European Union, but also there are very similar numbers um, in the world. And all these numbers are a consequence of our existing linear model of make, use, and dispose. And if we aim to restore our current human and architectural impact in the planet, then we need to work towards circular systems in architecture, circular systems that aim to close or to limit material and resource loss while having the potential to minimize waste, using this waste as a resource uh, in itself. And for such circular thinking, nature becomes a solid base to learn from. Nature, uh, as we all know, operates in the principle of abundance rather than scarcity, right? Um, and we keep on um, um, explaining that one of the problem of the construction industry is the scarcity of resources, but we need to think differently in that sense. Waste, for instance, in nature is a concept that uh, I mean, nature doesn't recognize that concept um, because um, nature only uh, recognizes resources that could be used in another life cycle within um, uh, its operation. Um, now, how can we minimize then waste in architecture? And how can we make a shift from a mindset of scarcity towards uh, one of abundance? I would like to discuss basically two ways of doing that. Um, the first one is introducing uh, circular materials in architectural design and construction. And the second way is to digitize matter so that we can deal with buildings as material banks. And I will come back um, to explain uh, with more details what I mean with that. First of all, for um, introducing circular materials uh, in architectural design, <clears throat> sorry, the first thing we need to work on is understanding the potential of waste, especially the agriculture and organic waste to be transformed in um, valuable and construction materials. Some of the projects um, uh, that we are developing at IAC, some of them are, are funded by uh, European research funds um, and they include creating structural building composites made, for example, out of biochar. Biochar or charcoal or type of charcoal, you might know that it is the byproduct of the pyrolysis of organic and agricultural waste. So in principle, we are talking about a solid material that it is mainly sequestrated carbon. Building with biochar means that uh, we can develop not just zero, but negative carbon emissions buildings. And we're working on, on um, uh, creating composites of, of this material so that we can develop structural uh, elements such as columns, beams, or structural walls. Uh, with the goal to achieve buildings that are made out of uh, CO2 instead of emitting uh, CO2. The most interesting part uh, of this work is that biochar is actually an excellent soil fertilizer. Actually, it is now being used mainly as a fertilizer. Um, so when the life cycle of this building composite is over, then they can be separated and go back to the soil uh, to fertilize it. So um, can we imagine then building bricks that they are negative carbon and they can, after the life cycle of their uh, building, they can be used uh, to go back and feed our soil for increasing agricultural production. This is um, uh, an example to showcase that, this, that, that um, a circular thinking is necessary when we are um, um, uh, developing the solutions for future uh, construction and future inhabitation. Of course, uh, biochar um, is, is also used in the biomass process. So we burn organic waste and we generate energy, which also means that we can, um, let's say, um, take advantage of an already existing process 
uh, of resource uh, creation through waste. Um, and apart from energy, it generates solid matter that we can build uh, with it. Now, this work uh, has initiated in the Digital Matter Studio that I lead at IAC for the last uh, almost uh, eight years. And um, it has been taken further by one of my PhD students, Nicole Kirova. And um, what um, is trying to test is different manufacturing methods, such as casting um, or 3D printing. Casting is composites, they are based on biochar, could give the possibility of reinforcement, while it will also tackle directly um, the existing methods in the market. No, this is something very important. Uh, while 3D printing, on the other hand, could offer the possibilities of creating functionally graded elements that they are based on structural performance, no? Um, 3D printed, as you can see in some of these diagrams, could also be suspended in concrete pool, while casting can eventually happen um, in a 3D printed uh, framework. Hence, in the case uh, of uh, uh, one of our, um, um, let's say, explorations of, of a column, for instance, we can see that the 3D printing uh, could allow us to select the most appropriate geometry and the most appropriate column mass uh, based on our goal to lower uh, the embodied carbon in that mass. No? Of course, the material mix here with um, natural additives and fibers uh, becomes a fundamental parameter for moving uh, towards more sustainable concrete composites. And uh, in the case of uh, the beam, uh, topological optimization could also support our design and, and manufacturing in order to define uh, the appropriate material mix in this composite. So topological optimization, I'm pretty sure many of you in your PhD work, um, um, uh, you probably touched upon this process, but it's a mathematical method that optimizes material layout within a given design space for a given set of loads, for instance, boundary conditions and constraints, and with the goal of maximizing the performance of the system. And in reality, combining computational methods of topology optimization with digital manufacturing, such as 3D printing, could allow us to deposit material only where it's needed. We're able, um, therefore, to introduce into our design discipline and the construction sector, a new way of approaching matter. If distribution, for instance, of graded material is considered, is considered in the design domain and the material properties change in a certain direction according to a, spe a specified variation, then this can lead to architectural products with asymmetric properties, something that currently uh, is considered problematic in the traditional way of construction. Now, such gradients in properties and in material mix uh, could contribute in huge savings of material resources, uh, minimizing the negative impact of the building industry and, of course, maximizing its performance, uh, whereas this is a structural, thermal, uh, embodied carbon uh, or, or other such as acoustic um, performances. Um, here, once again, we can see uh, a series of variations uh, in material mixtures, um, uh, biochar and concrete, so that we could uh, analyze them in terms of a bond embodied carbon uh, and mass, as well as um, in terms of uh, structural uh, performance. These are some of the prototypes that we did in order to uh, test the different mixtures in relation to their different properties. Um, now, in the case of a load-bearing wall, the parameters of design optimization actually could expand beyond the structural land uh, and include uh, elements uh, and parameters such as thermal or acoustic insulation uh, or interior uh, air circulation or, or even passive heating. In addition to that, um, we can, of course, again, uh, analyze and calculate the embodied carbon in the different geometries and the different mixes so that we can choose the most appropriate um, design, but also the most appropriate material system and material uh, mix um, for our construction. Now, although this is uh, still a work in progress and research 
uh, in progress, what we're envisioning as a final result could be um, something as simple as the one that you see in the screen, no? A simple shift in the geometry of certain structural elements of traditional constructions. Um, slab thickness uh, variation, for instance, based on loads, irregular distribution of vertical support elements, um, or even load uh, bearing elements enhanced to regulate uh, humidity, to increase thermal insulation, or um, to optimize uh, acoustic performance. Now, um, additionally to biochar, I, I also invite you to meet graphene. Um, I don't know if you are aware of this material, but it stands on the top of the list uh, of the future materials. Graphene is a one atomic thick layer of carbon atoms. It's highly conductive, it's thin, it's flexible and strong. It actually uh, has been considered uh, the greatest revolution in metamaterials research in the past 10 years while um, uh, its developers were awarded the Nobel uh, Prize in Physics in 2010. So it's a quite new uh, material. Now graphene's extraordinary properties present um, very high electrical and thermal conductivity, a zero gap semiconductivity, as well as high mechanical properties, making graphene the strongest material ever uh, tested. Now, graphene is also a great capacitor, which is why it's mainly used today for creating different kinds of sensors or batteries. And I know, I know that uh, some of you might wonder why I include this material directly after sewing you biochar. So can this super material be created by upcycled materials and waste? And can it uh, biodegrade after its use? The answer is yes, because uh, contemporary research have showcased that um, um, well, graphene is basically uh, a single layer of graphite, a naturally occurring carbon-based uh, mineral that it is commonly found it, uh, you know, in our pencils. But typically graphene, um, uh, graphite actually is mined and then mechanically processed in order to separate uh, its layers uh, forming graphene. However, obtaining uh, graphite can be uh, very expensive. So material scientists and researchers um, from Rice uh, University published less than a year ago results from a successfully developed technique called uh, flash chill heating to rapidly heat plastic materials to very high temperatures. Now, in contrast to traditional recycling plastic uh, techniques that keep the unbiodegradable plastic in the loop, this new um, uh, flash uh, dual heating method turns plastic into graphene, which as a carbon-based material, um, uh, you know that it, uh, it, it is not toxic and it would go into the soil as part of the inorganic matter, no? Um, following uh, some other research from the graphene flagship, which is uh, the one billion research uh, group funded by the European Union, they have published uh, a successful research uh, showcasing that graphene itself can even be biodegraded using human enzymes. So it's not, it's, it's not only a material that can be upcycled, but it can also eventually biodegrade, although um, in principle, uh, it is not toxic. So we have been using uh, this material in, in, in some of our recent projects. Let me turn off the sound. Um, in this project, we have developed in Digital Matter Studio with, explore, with the goal to explore solutions for responsive buildings that operate as uh, living and biological organisms, uh, including, for example, regulating their temperature as our human bodies do, produce oxygen, or even filter air and uh, digest uh, waste. Now, this specific uh, research zone um, in your screen explores a soft membrane building scheme that it is able to sense wind um, and to self deform in order to create protected areas from, for the users. Um, it, also, uh, it is also uh, intended to retain structural integrity. So initially we have been working with this uh, soft membrane, actuating it um, uh, by a pneumatic system for air inflation to achieve deformation. While 
the goal, of course, to discard external energy consuming pneumatic systems uh, brought us to think of other materials um, and uh, to use actually uh, the capacity of sensing and actuating of these materials. So the research evolved uh, by using graphene with the support of the uh, smart materials group of the Italian Institute of Technologies that they have given us a lot of insights on how to use uh, graphene and how to understand um, its properties. So um, I have already said that um, graphene could be used as a capacitive sensor, which is how it is basically used in this research, meaning it is a sensor that measures conductivity and resistance uh, and resistivity um, at differences in, in, in the system that you're using it in. So uh, as we can see in this video, so through the different levels of stretching of a membrane, it is possible to collect data on the changes of resistance as well as on the membrane's deformation. This is, this is uh, being achieved by using an artificial neural network that it is trained uh, through data. A robotic arm, as you have seen in this video, creates by pressing repetitively the membrane with different intensities. Now, different stretching degrees of the membrane provoke varied resistance levels in conductivity. So these data are collected and processed by the network, uh, which is eventually able to learn which value chains of resistance corresponds to which deformation. And this is how we can actually create a radical new uh, material, principally made out of waste and, and consisted in both physical and digital intelligence, a material that can sense its own deformation with, how, with uh, high accuracy. And eventually, uh, um, as a conductor, it could, it could also actuate uh, um, safe shifts of this uh, membrane. Now, um, let me, here you can uh, see basically the artificial neural uh, network, network data uh, produced, as well as the simulation of the performance of different uh, graphene sensing patterns that we have been testing. Um, based on similar uh, principles, um, the next project I want to share with you uh, utilizes the principle of neutral capacitive sensing of graphene, but it targets applications at an urban scale. Now, graphene composite here acts uh, both as sensor through uh, its capacitor property, but also as actuator through its conductive property. Um, here you can see a graphene-based floor tile that it is able to sense pedestrian and vehicle flows um, in the urban environment with high accuracy, but as well as with high privacy, since no surveillance or recognition techniques are required. And this research seeks to question the current applications of smart cities where billions of interconnected sensors and big data uh, are used with no clear efficiency or with no clear um, uh, regulations eventually on individual uh, privacy. And here, um, intelligence is integrated in the material itself of the urban surface, and it can develop an autonomous behavior. The system can sense, it can process occupancy data to train algorithms and to predict flows. And according to these predictions, uh, it can then actuate the urban area, either for instance, to light certain areas or to signal a change in mobility in real time, or to even control microclimates of outdoor uh, areas, since this tile could eventually heat itself in order to produce uh, certain heated areas where flows of people are dense and when uh, the climate requires it. So all to all, uh, a materially intelligent urban surface, um, um, which in a way could introduce new ways of navigating and uh, of course new ways of planning uh, our urban environments. And urban intelligence cannot be of course um, um, entirely or accurately supported just by plugged in sensors and actuators, but by additionally using the new materiality of the city as a sensor or actuator itself. So the urban data acquired could be overlapped with other big data, uh, such as the ones of land use or, 
or GDP uh, um, or contamination and or, 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 or let's say traffic. And it can open up great possibilities for both architects and decision makers to take more accurate and more informed decisions uh, in urban planning um, and in urban design. Now, an interesting reflection uh, from this work and, and these materials, uh, either upcycled or upcycled and, 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 and smart, is that um, creating a form and performance from the material nanoscale up from the bottom to top and following the morphogenetic, uh, let's say, capacity of matter requires basically nonlinear systems operation. It requires notions of systemic processes as well as produces variation of unpredicted results. And this go against, you know, like uh, the hylomorphic model, for instance, of Aristotle, where matter is separated from and it's a passive recipient for form. It also goes uh, against the Newtonian view where matter is homogeneous and as such is an obedience, uh, let's say, agent of external forces. Uh, and in this use, for matter to exist, a form is required to be imposed upon it from outside. Whereas um, in this new material uh, paradigm uh, for circular operations, uh, through a deep understanding of the material properties in nanoscale, um, we can operate uh, away of the traditional dualisms form matter, form performance, or form information, and we can uh, be aligned uh, with uh, the context of new materialism that, of course, uh, we know that in philosophy have been introduced by Delanda and by Gattari. Now, Delanda and Gattari have described, have described that matter is not homogenized, but it is considered as flow and as such, um, then it needs to be followed. And this state of flow becomes, in, becomes even more relevant in the case of circular materials where design and production is not limited in one final product, but takes into consideration further states and further uses of matter after the lifespan um, of the object uh, is over. Um, now, beyond uh, upcycling, um, materials and using waste as a future matter, we should not forget that there is a whole world of abundance in materials in nature and something that we seem that uh, we have forgotten while we got stuck in the steel and the concrete revolution. But earth uh, is one of the most um, uh, abundant materials and resources in our planet. Uh, and of course, it's not new. Earth constructions have been significant parts uh, of the architectural production for, uh, for centuries. Uh, buildings made of earth currently host more than 30% of the world's population with constructions as old as 5,000 years. And um, what we have worked um, on, on, on that topic is that we have revisited earth construction um, and we have technologically enhanced them for building affordable and circular housing. Now, together with our researchers and of course our students, we have developed an earth-based uh, material which is enhanced with bioadditives and requires no firing. Now, the earth mix is biodegradable, it's locally found, and since it requires no firing, it also means that once you build a prototype that would be a temporary shelter, uh, and its lifespan is over, then you can reuse the material to construct another one. And I will show in a while how we have done that in some of our work. We have been testing um, the performance of both material and design in our forest campus in Valdaura and tailored uh, from the global form to the resolution of the section of the wall, the prototype that uh, you see here uh, explores the possibilities to produce highly performative structural and passive climatic behavior uh, architectural elements. Uh, it is uh, basically a two meter wide and a five meter high printed clay wall with a varying thickness from 0 0.7 um, at its bottom to 0 0.2 um, um, uh, in its top and um, at a height of 2.6 meters, a wooden slab uh, rests on the wall as to simulate um, a clay wood building unit where the connections between two materials 
in the vertical uh, load from horizontal slab uh, can be eventually tested. And it is a self-standing structure in which the thickness of the wall and the geometry, uh, it is six layers uh, um, and designed to match uh, basically the structural requirements. So um, the wall uh, is also designed according to the local climate, taking into consideration the solar incidence, the yearly temperatures, uh, as well as the humidity. Of course, in this case, we have been designing for Barcelona, so the data, um, the input data um, uh, comes from uh, Barcelona um, uh, latitude and longitude. So with the long uh, established uh, understanding of clay's thermal properties to moderate heat transmission, um, the research team has sought for a design to even uh, 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 enhance its properties. A ventilated wall design enabled uh, through operable top and bottom um, openings. Uh, it is created to either reduce, for example, heat gain in summertime through convention between uh, top and bottom openings or to retain heat um, in the winter as both openings uh, are closed. And uh, its external geometry is tested for enhancing self sading and thermal properties. The final um, iteration of, of the pattern consists uh, of uh, surface of pumps of which the calibrated geometry creates a self sading uh, pattern, optimizing cooling in summer and, and heat absorption uh, in winter, and of course, taking into consideration the local conditions of climate. The other crucial aspect being uh, factor into the bump design is the printability, where the design is confined to can deliver at angles of less than 30 degrees as a result of the limitations basically of uh, the material and, and the printing technology um, which is currently available. So in the launch uh, of this research, and, and for many years, we have been using uh, actually our robotic arm uh, at IAC uh, to 3D print uh, either small elements uh, such as columns or the above mentioned uh, prefabricated components for creating, for example, um, walls. But um, within a circular thinking of um, local production, we were interested to see how we can easily bring machines and robots on the construction site. And allow me now to jump into a much um, older project um, because we have been working um, for the last decade on the one hand on the, upon the potential of robotic manufacturing and especially additive manufacturing, but uh, we have done that with a goal of, of uh, an on-site construction uh, vision. So on-site construction is a powerful concept for reducing the ecological and monetary cost of transporting materials and equipment. And of course, it also offers the possibility of using locally sourced materials. And we know on the other hand that additive manufacturing is a radical digital manufacturing technique that can reduce waste since there is no need of joints or molds uh, during the construction and then you can only deposit material when you need it. So uh, what you see here uh, in the screen is a project from uh, uh, back in 2012 in collaboration with Joris Larman Laboratory. And um, with some of our research and students, we have developed a technique to contour craft and to print three-dimensional curves with no need of any support base or printed uh, bed. We were actually calling that, we still call it 3D printing in the air. Um, now, the interesting part of this project um, came when we realized its limitations because we, um, we were envisioning bringing such technologies uh, on site, as you can see in the images uh, above, and to create complex forms on site without the need of prefabricated pieces or without the need of big uh, machines that uh, require supports um, 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 to, 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 to be constructed. So this project soon made us realize that although the idea of bringing machines on site had a big potential, at the end of the day, we were limited by the size of these machines. Uh, in order to print big, uh, we needed machines bigger than the prints themselves, something that made us actually uh, rethink our printers and uh, uh, rethink uh, our tools. So um, we looked to robotic engineering and we looked to swarm robotics uh, in order to learn how we could build these new tools that we were um, um, 
um, required for such a vision, no? And this is how the mini builders uh, project emerged. Um, uh, again, uh, back in 2013 and 14, uh, we have uh, worked with uh, research and students and um, the aim was to create mobile machines that can print bigger than themselves and that can easily be transported and assembled on site to work. Now, instead of one large machine, big one large machine, its individual robot works independently, performing uh, diverse tasks as well as on a single uh, structural outcome. Now, each robot is linked um, to sensors and to um, a local positioning system. And this feeds uh, live data into custom software that allows control of movement and printing of the material uh, output, such as um, um, the artificial marble polymer that we have used uh, in this uh, process. Now, the largest of this uh, um, robot uh, is just uh, 42 centimeter, basically um, 16 inches. And they are uh, three of them. They are a family of three robots. The foundation robot that as you have just seen in the video, uh, scanned the plan lines and then built upon uh, those lines, the foundation of the structure. Then the second robot is the grip robot that uh, grips on the foundation uh, and prints a new layer stepping on the previous one. And of course, uh, the third one is the vacuum robot that through a vacuum system, can deposit material in vertical axis and can open up possibilities for much more complex geometries than the one uh, that we can um, uh, initially produce. Well, I am showing these uh, two uh, last projects mainly for their potential of on-site construction and of course not for their circularity in materials since both projects um, um, for the sake of developing the technology they have been using thermoset polymers meaning materials that they are not sustainable at all. But let's keep this concept of mobile uh, machines and on-site manufacturing because this is how we have evolved our research um, to combine it with our earth uh, construction uh, research. So um, highly interested on, on, on that concept, um, we um, observed um, that um, a collaborator of us, uh, a collaborative company, Technalia, had uh, this kind of machine in their um, facilities. It is basically a cable robot, uh, very easy to be um, mantled and dismantled uh, at any site, um, very easy to uh, transport. Um, and it's actually very similar to the technology that is being used in uh, uh, football games in stadiums in order to record um, uh, games from different angles. And we decided to, um, work with this machine and to hack it um, and to do that we built a nozzle that could deposit earth-based natural material we have attached this nozzle to the machine and we have all of a sudden created uh, a big 3d printer of non-fired um, uh, clay of uh, natural uh, material that could be found inside that is a machine that it can be easily transported and installed on site while uh, it can uh, be also easily dismantled, giving the possibility to cover a huge uh, scale of construction. Now, in the last uh, years, we have uh, developed a series of prototypes with that machine, um, the biggest one being uh, one that we have presented in the Construmat. Construmat is the most, uh, is the biggest uh, construction for uh, in Spain, and we did that, uh, I mean, we wanted to bring that machine inside the exhibition and we wanted to print live on site for the four days that the exhibition lasted. Um, this was uh, a way to showcase to the traditional industry that um, um, this is possible, it is quick, it is sustainable, and it could eventually create uh, uh, a series of uh, alternative uh, aesthetics in, in the way that we know um, earth architecture traditionally. And um, uh, not only that, we were also able to actually produce with that material that has uh, these uh, thermal properties, we were able to produce uh, um, structural performance, but also passive cooling um, in our building. These are some uh, of the prototypes that we have been developing, different variations in the patterns uh, for achieving this uh, performance in terms of uh, cooling uh, and heating. 
second, uh, we have additionally explored the possibility of using aerial robots in order to be able to monitor the printed structure on site in real time in terms of geometry on the one hand and in terms of material uh, state, material curing uh, state. So real time information could be sent uh, through the drones, um, through the drone scanning to an interface that could control the speed printing so as to reassure the dryness of the print layer and the viscosity of the material to be printed. But on the other hand, data was also sent to that interface in relation to the print geometry so that the computational interface could allow for small uh, geometry corrections. And, and this is something very, very important and crucial when we are working with materials that they, that they shrink basically when they dry, which is the case of um, earth and clay. So although the uh, prefabricated technologies um, are advancing uh, in high speeds and seems to be the one preferred by the market, through this work, we wish to highlight the opportunities of on-site construction assisted by mobile technologies such as ground or aerial uh, robots. And on-site construction allow us to go into remote areas where resources are limited and use the local materials on-site to quickly produce zero kilometer construction. It prevents the difficulties uh, of moving large uh, models into tight spaces which makes it an appropriate construction method in the urban and, and congested areas. And it finally offers greater flexibility in terms of renovation and numerous customized options in building uh, design and details. And as you can see in the video, um, uh, it also allows to break down the structure, uh, the local material in order to be reused uh, for um, uh, another building uh, or another structure. Now through this work, um, we have been approached and, and we have uh, been um, uh, working in collaboration with uh, UN Inhabitant on designing and prototyping in areas uh, such as Africa and Asia, which was the main goal for uh, UN Habitat, uh, designing um, natural, 100 natural material uh, based urban neighborhoods, dealing with almost extreme climates that could be found there and offering solutions for affordable and passive uh, houses. Now, low-cost sustainable houses, that they are 100% uh, recyclable, natural. They involve the community in their design and construction and might give solutions to displaced population in the world. And it is an interesting way to put digital technologies such as robots or additive manufacturing to the service of people uh, and communities in need. Uh, enriching these digital technologies and, and processes with people's cultural background, with feedback from their skills, and of course, uh, the crafts. And I want to highlight uh, that uh, although many, cons many, let's say, relate the concept, the concept of earth architecture with uh, developing countries, uh, we also foresee um, this earth-based construction in the west part of the world, radically questioning the contemporary concrete manufacturing, the environmental footprint, um, or even the aesthetics of the final outcome. Now, let me jump to timber, uh, which is another natural material that we can grow um, and use for sustainable construction. Within the circular uh, design thinking, what is important um, um, to the timber is where this timber comes from and eventually where it goes after its use. So what you see in the picture is our Ayak Forest campus. I've shown uh, that to you before, Valdaura campus, which is um, uh, located within this natural park. And as I told you, one of the goals of this campus is to be able to locally generate all the resources that we need. So in terms of materials, in terms of material resources, in collaboration with the administration of the natural park, uh, with, forex, with forest experts and with arborists, we are basically uh, set up a strategy and we are growing and managing our forest for locally producing timber that we can then process and we can use it to build prototypes of self-sufficient buildings. This is the main a goal of one of our master programs that are taking place there. And um, these are some of the 
uh, outcomes of, of the final prototypes that we're creating every year. So in this project, the interesting thing is not only to build with a natural negative carbon material, but also to make sure that this material is a zero kilometer material that we can grow as close as possible um, to the construction site. Now, integrating uh, zero kilometer uh, materials in construction requires from designers to expand their operational materials that can be purchased locally, that do not need to be transformed, and at the end of their useful life can be returned to the environment. And in other words, we should encourage the use of local products and preferably these that have not undergone uh, major stages of industrial processing. So such approach primarily aims to provide more sustainable, healthy, economical, and of course, socially accessible um, buildings that are strongly linked to our, um, the identity of the site. Now, it is also important um, to realize that uh, circular design is not just about using natural materials or upcycle waste. It uses, I mean, circular design in its principle, it uses as few resources as possible uh, and keep resources in circulation for as long as possible. Now that makes design highly relevant, design for longevity with repairability in mind, uh, or design for disassembly, for instance, are crucial so that materials can be easily dismantled and be reused when the lifespan of a building um, is over. And design for disassembly is a concept in which uh, buildings and products are designed intentionally for material recovery, for uh, value retention and meaningful uh, next use. So in such process, it is fundamental to think of modular building elements such as the ones you see in the screen. Uh, the way these modular elements are connected among them, the joints system, and which technologies are putting them together or taking them apart. In the case that you see in the screen is of course the robotic arm, but it could be done with other agents, um, uh, technological or human ones. And one way to approach uh, design for disassembly is uh, to design material systems from scratch, such as um, the ones we see here, um, but um, there is also um, another way, um, especially thinking that there is a lot of material uh, and, and building stock uh, available rather than creating a modular system that we need um, to uh, order wood uh, that we don't know where it is coming from and, and set up um, our, our design and our, our construction. So what about the existing building stock that could be found in our existing buildings. Um, an exciting aspect of the circular thinking is that we can consider these buildings as material banks, as I was saying before, and we can work on different technologies of mapping, tracing, or scanning these existing materials to evaluate which ones could be eventually uh, reused and uh, create alternative material libraries for construction. Uh, if we can have a look at uh, data related with the material flow of our built environment, we can realize that only 19% of the total building stock is currently uh, being recycled or reused, while the rest of 21% ends up in landfills or this basically downcycled. So the aim of this work is to increase the amount of material recycled and reused up to 90% of the building uh, stock could be eventually reuse, um, which will also lead in decreasing the quantity that is being uh, downcycled or, or the quantity that is resulting in the landfills. So one way to digitize matter uh, in these buildings is through scanning technologies uh, using aerial vehicles such as drones. No? Um, this is a project developed in our um, Master in Robotics and Advanced Construction program uh, with a group of students and researchers. And uh, they have been using drones to scan the building elements of our facilities um, in our building at IAC in, in Barcelona and collect data on um, um, the size of these building elements, the type and the materiality. The objective is to showcase how matching algorithms along with generative design and digital fabrication can be used to integrate materials uh, retrieved from pre-demolition sites 
and of course develop uh, new structures while minimizing waste and, and maximizing efficiency. So within this uh, process, there are two types of data sets one related to data scan uh, in pre-demolition and a second data set related to post-demolition. An interface here in this video. And once processing uh, these data sets through algorithms and computation, we're actually able to create categories of different building elements, as you can see in the interface, and materials such as concrete uh, blocks, wooden beams or brick walls, among others, that they can be reused in another building uh, in the future. So the three important steps uh, of this process include building inspection on the one hand with the aerial uh, robots, as I was saying, using computer vision. Then the second step is classification and localization of that material stock. And this we do it by using uh, material, uh, using uh, machine learning algorithms. And the third and last step um, is a geometry reconstruction based on the typology of the classification and, and localization uh, data set. So the first case studies um, that the um, group uh, has been uh, exploring is, um, um, as I was saying, the main IAC building in Barcelona. And here you can see some possibilities developed uh, on the reuse of the structural elements um, uh, of our IAC building. So these are the beams of our building and um, uh, the vision here is to use it uh, as a wooden elements of a facade system of any construction for regulating light or for or even for creating some building gardens um, in the construction, as you can see in the uh, bottom right of, of, of your screen. Now, what it is important to understand is that such concepts and processes, they can introduce new evaluation criteria that can set, let's say, up for buildings. Till now, for instance, we, we, we are evaluating uh, buildings on energy performance uh, using, for instance, the LEED certificates. But could we do something similar with uh, the material aspect? Um, that would give buildings uh, a unique material passport or certificate that describes the material value they have after their life cycle is over. And in order to do that, of course, we would need uh, to rethink our urban infrastructure. We need a new urban infrastructure in the cities, circular hubs, for instance, uh, where separation process and sorting of these materials could happen. In Europe, within the European Green Deal, uh, the European Commission is already setting up these regulations and principles so that many cities uh, have already started to implement um, this, um, um, let's say, um, the strategies uh, of creating circular hubs as a new urban infrastructure in cities. Now, similar techniques uh, of monitoring and scanning could also be extrapolated in natural environments that uh, surround our cities, such as the forests or natural parks. And in this project here um, that has been developed in our forest campus, uh, we use photogrammetry in order to digitize the forest and in order to create a digital twin of existing timber resources. Now through photogrammetry, we're able to scan the existing trees, detect the ones that uh, could be cut and create a database of their trunk morphology and their properties and eventually build a catalog of design solutions. Now this is, I mean, very, very important process of optimizing resources because you know, the existing timber industry produces huge amounts of waste. Of course, this waste is then downcycled, but um, in order to get these beautiful straight elements of timber and the best quality of them, uh, we discard big part of biomass, creating a waste which can be significantly reduced if we manage to audit accurately our existing resources and then couple this with design creativity and optimization. Uh, and of course, you know, the aesthetic of such species, as you can see on the bottom right of this page, uh, is also starting to appear closer to a forest rather than a, a, a traditional construction. And a digitization of matter could also happen at an urban scale, not only uh, a building scale. Uh, using um, artificial intelligence techniques as, such as computer vision and machine learning, here, um, 
uh, we see that we can analyze huge amounts of geotagged uh, street view images and create building stock classification maps. In this work, uh, almost 18 uh, thousands of street view images of building apartments in Barcelona has been scrapped with the goal to create material libraries and detailed uh, geolocated maps of concrete, uh, steel or timber building. And other possibilities include um, creating uh, maps of uh, uh, level of deteriorated, for instance, state of uh, buildings or urban maps with geolocated data on buildings that are to be demolished uh, in the next few years. The possibility of creating uh, material libraries becomes fundamental for the reuse of this building stock at an urban scale. But the fact that we can geolocate these libraries adds another value to the circular design process since materials can be chosen, not just from a, a whichever material library, but based on the criteria um, uh, on, on, on their appropriate typology for reuse, but also on how close they can be found to the new building site that will be reusing um, this material stock. Further uh, analyzing uh, the digital uh, matter data, we can then come up with entire libraries of building facades based on their dimension, their materiality, or even their age and state. And, and such libraries have huge potential to promote new circular design operations in the building industry, such as the application we see here, which is uh, a project, uh, a brilliant reuse of entire brick facade blocks upcycled uh, from the historical Carlsberg uh, breweries in Copenhagen. Um, I also um, want to somehow share with you certain reflections uh, in relation to that circular um, design operations and the, material, the materialization of them. Uh, because in contrast to the traditional notion of uh, form follows function, this new material paradigm promotes a form finding process that is based on set of multiple data sets, including possibilities for upcycle, biodegradability, or embodied carbon, as we have seen among other parameters. Now, the form in its turn is not a final form, but one of many geometrical states that matter could form during the different steps of its use, but also its reuse. And it's interesting here to highlight that this variation of material states and programmatic uses could potentially not only be formed by information in this data, but also could reveal uh, information. If buildings, for example, are designed with repairability in mind or, or design, uh, designed to be disassembled, then new ways of evaluating buildings will emerge, such as, for example, the material passports that reveal information on the origins of materials that they are used in that building, uh, or the possibilities of upcycling, uh, of this material in another building uh, when the lifespan is over. And such novel uh, indicators on the built environment expands the functions that architecture traditionally served until now. We can talk about a paradigm shift in how the discipline and practices of architecture operate in the design and manufacturing process, as well as a paradigm shift in the way users use or choose buildings to live in or even to acquire as, 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 as their property. And the principles and notions um, of materializing circular design, such as uh, repairability or design for disassembly or biodegradability, as we have mentioned, or upcycle and growth, um, not only influence the paradigm of design protocols and processes, but they also influence as well the very same form, uh, language, and aesthetic qualities of built space. Quoting uh, maybe Baudrillard here, more than aesthetics, any material object uh, has a symbolic value that is not limited in technical dimensions or material consistencies. And this value can convert objects into symbols for humans and for society. So the new material paradigm is also a new cultural one uh, in which uh, statics, waste, repetition or partition grids traditionally related with the industrial model of mass production of property or comfort, they give way to notions of unpredictability, performance, metabolic cycles, and of course, uh, organic natural principles. And we perceive architecture and built environment as a temporary cycle 
that could evolve to transform into other forms of architecture or other forms of resources such as energy, biomass or new uh, building blocks. And this plasticity model of breaking down matter brings uh, new notions of symbolisms in the built environment rather than approaching architecture as, as a rigid uh, protective layer made out of scraps and, and, and by finite resources, we can deal with our built environment as an extension of the resources that we can keep in the loop as much as possible. In such environments, instead of increasing instead of increasing human power and domain, empowering new coexistence, we can say, uh, and therefore possible emotions of concern or even empathy. And they are characterized by an increased awareness that human behavior and natural resources affects our built environment, changing them, and that these chains then affect human behavior and resources in return in a cyclical way and in a visible way. Now, this might be the start of another level of sustainability awareness, one beyond optimization and comfort, but of true dialogue, uh, of true dialogue, of true coexisting, of true co-being, where the decision of the resources of one have a direct uh, impact to the other and vice versa. And this uh, circular design and, and material model, it is in contrast to the model of perfect finishing and control, no? as we can see in some of these images. Um, um, this perfect finishing and control that we have seen in contemporary digital or smart buildings paradigm is something that we see um, that we see it altered uh, in that model. Uh, it rather instable, it resembles uh, self-organized and informal configurations um, with blurred boundaries. Uh, it defies top-down logics and it boosts notion of evolution and life and therefore their inherent characteristics of decay or even collapse. Mm -hmm. And this model along with other emerging practices, including of course, um, um, bioarchitecture might underline the beginning of a truly deep shift uh, in the aesthetic as well as in the functional operation of architecture. And um, another uh, um, reflection that, that could emerge uh, is a note in authorship and, and the role of the designer. You know, if materials are designed to respond to predefined stimuli of structural or environmental data, if users are given the possibility to customize their spaces through interfaces or through, cho or through choosing, for example, materials from material libraries of reuse, um, if natural or biomaterials decay or alter their properties following non-human controlled parameters, if material and fabrication systems based on evolutionary algorithms develop certain self-awareness, if AI systems take decisions, then who is the final designer of the space. And what is the role of the contemporary designer, right? Well, I, you know, maybe David Green with, uh, would, would say here with apologies to the master and to the star architects, but it is of great uh, importance to explain that uh, this new material model inherently tends to hack authorship. The notions and protocols of circular design and the computation and fabrication processes surrounding it uh, it favor more bottom-up collaborative and emerging outcomes rather than top-down uh, individual uh, and controlled decision. And as we saw through um, in most of the examples that I showed you today, this does not mean that the designer is not of significant importance. It is important to promote the idea of a designer, not as a one only author or, or the creator of a top-down unique design and unique final form, but rather as the designer and creator of open-ended systems, where final decision is made by the resonance of multiple agents, right? Including the environment, but also the users, the material properties, the fabrication uh, protocols um, um, and limitations that we have um, uh, at hand. And the architect, uh, it, it, it therefore follows um, Gordon uh, Pask's wish uh, and it becomes a system designer, a system designer who instead of designing a building or a city catalyzes them, allowing them to evolve in unpredictable conditions and forms while acquiring uh, a variety of behaviors. And while the process of designing systems instead of forms 
favors the dissolution of authorship by no means um, uh, does favor the dissolution of uh, the necessity of the architect, who in, uh, in an evolving role becomes the crucial medi mediator between physical space, users, matter, uh, and the environment itself. And uh, we think this new, um, let's say, physically, materially, and digitally, you no, know, with codes and data, digitally driven dynamic environments, design becomes uh, more crucial than ever. It emerges as a, as a constructive synthesis of thought and action, um, being open uh, to include an architecture of systemic correlation among humans, uh, technology, uh, nature, and uh, artifice. Um, I will close this talk by highlighting that um, Materializing circular design and architecture and construction is an urgent action we architects are called to take in order to minimize our industry's negative impact in the environment and in the society. We are urged to come up with alternative material models, material paradigms, material systems to the prevailing ones of uh, resource uh, consuming and contaminating. And that requires a lot of different technologies and of course requires uh, new creative uh, processes in design. From expanding um, uh, to material science expertise using natural abundant resources, such as the earth-based materials or the urban waste streams for housing I showcased, um, to use robotic technologies for auditing and monitoring existing material stock that can be reused. While it is clear is that our discipline uh, needs uh, to rethink its operation while we also need to educate uh, differently the future architects uh, and of course the future uh, building experts. So um, with that, um, I will sum up the talk. I'm really looking forward to our um, short discussion on these topics and thank you very much for bearing with me and, and for, for following and listening. Fantastic. Uh, it's a mind-blowing lecture. So thanks a lot to Bratty. Um, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, our um, um, specialist um, uh, in Zoom, probably. Would you like to uh, put forward questions to Bratty uh, firstly? And then we have some questions from uh, YouTube and Bidvidi, and uh, I would like to ask her uh, a follow-up follow later. Nick, are you here? Nick Bao. Hi, already maybe probably uh, I want to uh, give some comments from my perspective firstly. Uh, it's impressive. Uh, although we know most of your project, but I, see, I can see um, um, a lot of progress in the past two years, uh, even after the um, um, uh, uh, pandemic. So uh, it's interesting to you cover a lot of um, uh, different topic, including uh, the design thinking, including the paradigm shift, including uh, the education um, system. So the first thing I want to put forward is, is kind of a mind-blowing uh, challenge to uh, the education system. Um, I, I think it's in, interestingly, uh, in IAC, uh, what you're doing is uh, set up a very good model, which links uh, the active discipline to the new technology. I think um, the new technology is, is, is moving super fast, including right now, and um, artificial intelligence, like uh, what's new organized in the past few days, which is coming uh, really fast. But actually, uh, from maybe from a the the theoretical perspective, is uh, new is putting forward some like uh, something uh, at the vanguard uh, is, is more uh, focused on the uh, the theoretical or the, the thinking perspective or on the consciousness as imagination, how we can make design. But I think in Iraq, uh, uh, you, you, you make a full use of um, the instruments, including the softwares, including the hardwares, but it, which is still address everything in the active discipline. So uh, my first question goes to, uh, the education pedagogy uh, system and uh, how we organize our PhD program and how we organize our education system to address 
um, our discipline in the future because um, the architect discipline is a, such a long history, more than 5,000, 6,000 years. And um, uh, the, what's the essential part of the discipline and how to um, uh, encountering with all this kind of new technology and keep um, what is the uh, essential the core part of the discipline. So Arati would you like to make some highlights um, on this question. Sure, uh, Philip. Uh, thanks for for the question and and the comments. Um, I think, as I was saying um, in the beginning, that um, and at the end of my talk, actually, that education um, requires uh, a reorganization, not only in terms of formats. Uh, we have seen that, and it evolves, and it is great, but also in terms of content, right? Um, what it is very, very important is to understand that today, non-discipline itself could actually give solutions to the complex challenges that we're facing, either those are environmental, economic, or social ones. Um, we need to bring uh, disciplines uh, together. And um, um, the architect uh, is um, uh, always, uh, let's say, the mastermind of, of a matrix of complex operation. And I think that this should uh, be very, very important uh, within the um, pedagogical models that uh, we will be developing and, and evolving further. So there is a big responsibility from, um, uh, for our discipline. Um, because for many years, and um, it has been great, we have been enclosed in our laboratories, testing the technologies. Uh, we have been so much attracted by the fact that we were able to, to, to have robots, to have accessible machines, to create uh, workshops in our schools, um, um, uh, to, to, to use um, um, computational power, to produce like very, very complex high resolution designs and, 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 and parametric, let's say, um, an associative uh, generative design solutions. And I think it was a great moment uh, because we, we really needed to have this time to, um, to, to experiment with the technology. But uh, what it is important within education is that architects need to understand that they have a huge responsibility on the solutions that they uh, propose, on the technologies that they use towards um, um, the global challenges. And that means that on the one hand, uh, speculation is fantastic for driving visions, but we also need to combine with uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, real case solutions um, that doesn't necessarily only affect design principles, but also affect, um, as, as I was saying, uh, you know, like greater societal issues and, and greater uh, environmental issues. So the responsibility, the raising of awareness uh, through the education uh, that architects need to um, somehow tackle these challenges is fundamental. And then the multidisciplinarity, um, as I was saying, the fact that technologies now uh, cannot serve the architect unless the architect really dips into understanding other disciplines such as biology or mathematics or data science uh, or material science. No, and and I think that um, for for uh, some time um, now in the contemporary architectural education system, there has been a kind of a disconnection with this important. Uh, fields, uh, especially the material one, you know, architecture is a very material driven discipline, but still uh, we've seen that um, for some time this has been disconnected uh, from the traditional educational uh, processes. Um, so this needs to come back and to expand it to other disciplines, no? Um, and last but not least is what I was saying in the beginning, you know, like the fact that we need to allow space for experimentation. There is no um, solution uh, from the self that we can use to give answers to the challenges that we're facing. If there were any, we would have used it, but there is not. So we need to develop new solutions. We need to develop new ideas. And that means that we need to have a space for creative um, uh, processes. We need to have a space for experimentation. We need to have a space, physical or virtual, and eh? not necessarily physical, but we need to have uh, a space for, for that dialogue. And, and a space for that making. No, making is important. We need to have somehow 
it, it becomes really fundamental, as I was saying in the beginning, to be able to test some of these ideas, no? to pilot them um, uh, in, real, uh, in real scale, but also in real case studies. This is not always easy for academy. Um, uh, it is not, but um, there are different ways of collaboration that should be established among uh, academy industry. And as I was saying before, even decision makers. So I will stay with these uh, three or four, uh, let's say uh, key aspects, um, responsibility, multidisciplinarity, um, um, learning out of making and yeah, in in intercommunication for collective creation and, and, um, and pilot projects. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the feedback. I think, um, what I appreciate uh, quite a lot from Areti's uh, lecture is you presenting the quality of the discipline and the core uh, uh, knowledge of the discipline, which is, I think, uh, improving by the experimental process of your teaching and uh, of what you're doing in the past few years. Uh, you're not uh, losing the, the core of the discipline, but at the same time, innovation is happening. So to balance this kind of um, um, uh, the new technology and the, the core essential part of the architecture discipline is the most um, uh, important um, from my perspective on IAC. So that is first um, impression from, um, from uh, my perspective. And secondly, I think um, this is really interesting. Uh, you're showing your farm um, uh, a fabrication lab that is extremely beautiful site. And also you have different campus and different um, education, um, 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 uh, your, your schools. I think um, I want to know maybe, uh, could you briefly introduce how uh, in Iraq you organize um, not only your PhD program, but also your graduate school and uh, how, how do you organize your um, different um, uh, semesters? And uh, what's the background of your students? How you allocate from a, a tradition uh, arch architecture education process and transfer this kind of students into uh, this computational design and, and, and the digital fabrication special courses? Could you make some brief introduction on that? At the same time, I think it's fantastic you're showing some industry influence or a potential uh, transfer from your study to the, the scenarios of the construction projects. And I'm also interested in that. Could you make some brief introduction on how you set up all this kind of process and how do you organize the Institute and, and uh, followed by this special uh, uh, research and, uh, topic? and a special uh, discipline, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will try to answer that. Um, actually, one interesting thing um, about IAC is that we are a small uh, institute. We are a nonprofit foundation, basically, and we collaborate with the Public Polytechnic School of Barcelona, where uh, um, the, the UPC, the Public Polytechnic School uh, of, of Barcelona is accrediting all our programs. But ourselves as a, as a nonprofit foundation, we are combining not only the educational part, but we're also serving as a research institute. So um, the way that we are organizing, uh, let's say our teaching and research is on the one hand, through a series of uh, master's programs and PhDs. We do not have an undergrad at IAC. We only work with, uh, with professionals, um, uh, let's say uh, with uh, people that they already have a degree, right? And um, we have a series of different master programs that they are dealing with the different research uh, lines that we are focusing on. For example, we have a master in city and technology uh, um, um, focusing on the use of big data, on urban analytics, on on on, on co-design processes, and on on AI in in urban spaces. We have a master in um, uh, advanced ecological buildings, when we are where we are actually testing all the uh, using uh, timber of the forest in order to create um, um, uh, self-sufficient buildings. No, we have a, a master in robotics and advanced construction where we are testing and researching the technologies behind some of these design and manufacturing processes. So the way that we are organized in this sense is that 
our master programs are following different research lines that we're doing. And then the PhD program is a PhD that we have launched recently, like two years back, and it's a collaboration with the Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, uh, together with our dear friends, uh, Jane uh, Berry, uh, the Dean of the school, of the architectural school and, and, and Mark Berry. So um, we are actually creating uh, a space for PhD that could happen jointly between Barcelona and Melbourne, right? And um, the, um, the PhD students could uh, either follow um, a personal research um, statement that is aligned with uh, the, let's say, research um, uh, topics of our institute, or they can be part of um, a European uh, fund. Um, either this is, for example, the InnoChain uh, platform that we have been all uh, participating very actively, set by CETA and, and, and Mette Ramska uh, Thompson, um, or uh, other funded projects uh, that um, uh, they have a certain goal and then PhD students are becoming part of this. So it's not only research and academic research that they are doing, but also trying to be part of, a, of an active uh, project, no? And um, the way that we, we bring industry uh, in uh, this is, first of all, the fact that we're working with master and PhD students makes it much more easy to do this experimental work that we're doing. We do not, uh, at IAG, we do not, we almost don't have teachers and students. We are all researchers. Uh, because we're trying to work on, on projects that there, there are no uh, references uh, whatsoever. So um, um, we, don't, we don't follow a model of somebody teaching what they know, but we are actually working together as a research team. So the way that we include industry in this um, uh, model is basically either by um, bringing challenges from the industry to uh, the academic uh, world uh, through our master studios, or um, um, moving uh, master studios inside um, European funded research projects where industry uh, is part of it. So this is a kind of a double way of, of uh, doing that. Great. Um, before I uh, ask questions from on the floor, maybe uh, I would like to invite a new, would you like to put forward your comments on the lecture and uh, any questions is appreciated. You. Yeah, th thank you, Philip. Yeah. Hi, Ereti. It's great to see you again. Um, I just wanted to say, I mean, just to, I think that, that, that what you highlighted was how um, we need to rethink the whole kind of process of, of design and as a system and so on. I guess the other thing that's been going on is this, this issue about rethinking the kind of the, the structural logic of education. And, and I just to say, I, I'm not sure if Philip's aware, but the uh, the digital consortium that the, 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 the term we're using actually came from a, a proposed collaboration many years ago, actually 2008, 2000, uh, uh, yeah, um, between uh, not Swinburne and IAC, but, but Brighton and IAC. And it, it didn't go forward because of uh, a sort of conservative notion uh, of trying to control things from, from Brighton's point of view. But anyway, it's great to see that Swinburne thing has happened. But I just want to say there was a whole genealogy of, of, of different um, operations from that. I mean, Vicente Gaia, when we were talking about those things, he was in, in the early days, he was saying, you know, it doesn't make sense anymore to um, think, I mean, an aircraft, right, is, 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 is you know, now it's not made in one place. The wings are made in one country, the engines are made in another country, uh, the fuselage is made in another country. We have to think about these things in terms of, uh, you know, uh, complex systems. Um, and that, I guess, was that kind of way of thinking whereby you try to use resources from many different places and bring people together, led to a whole series of experiments in terms of doctoral programs. The, uh, the European Graduate School one, which was kind of based on that, you brought in I don't know, Mammal de Lander, or you brought in kind of um, uh, uh, Akimengis and so on to, to a platform. Uh, that was the first iteration of it. And actually, the second one was the Tongji one, where we kind of established that uh, in, in a, also as, as a logic behind things of um, bringing, pooling resources. And then more recently, the the FIU one, which is kind of trying to make it, take it onto a digital platform. And this is, I guess, that this potentially could be something that we're looking for as, as a kind of the next model, whereby uh, instead of these individual professors, as, as, as Philip was saying, in individual classrooms, teaching individual groups, we actually find a way of operating together. And that, of course, makes complete sense in many ways, because actually a PhD or doctoral research is, is, 
it's kind of expensive in some senses in, in that you have few students. Um, and also you don't really have the kind of the, in any institution apart from maybe MIT, you don't really have the kind of the pool of knowledge where you can cover all these things. So it makes complete sense to collaborate in some ways. So, you know, I think that this is, uh, uh, I, you know, this is an ongoing question. I think we really do have to try and think of, of new models of education that make much more sense where we can, where we can come together. And I must say that the last few days when we've been holding uh, doctoral um, progress reviews has been really interesting because, again, the students themselves are operating in isolation and to be able to have a platform where everyone can share ideas has been a really uh, uh, incredibly uh, useful um, uh, operation. So I, I just think that I just want to make that comment is kind of the, to, to put things in the context. It's actually really interesting to see how things are developing now at IAC um, based on that. I used to teach at IAC, but it, it was a fantastic experience and I wish I could do more of it. But there was another question I wanted to, want to raise because it came up in our in our doctoral platform discussion yesterday. And that's to say that, I mean, um, it's interesting what IAC has been doing over the years because you know, IAC only existed because of the failure of, of, of mo most mainstream schools of architecture to provide that education. You know, it, it, and, and, uh, and, and, and I guess the comparison we've been making is, is uh, in terms of, of other operations is say it's a bit like you know, Uber only exists because of the failure of the taxi service. I mean, the, the taxi was so inefficient, they created Uber you know, in some ways. So it seems to me that the kind of like, you know, uh, what IAC has been doing has been responding to a, a, a systematic failure within education. Now, theoretically, I guess, eventually, uh, the idea is that, that maybe Uber is forcing uh, 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 mainstream taxis to improve their act. So eventually, IAC should be made redundant because eventually, if the message gets through, every single school of architecture uh, is going to be improving and trying to take on board the kind of things that you've been doing. And I think that's happening to some extent. I think most schools now are getting robotic arms and so on. They're kind of catching up in some way. But what I find interesting is, is the way that IAC has mutated in some senses from initially just the kind of focus on the technology towards sustainable things and how the kind of the technology and the sustainable things are, are uh, coming out. So I, I, what I see is IAC as a kind of a uh, as an emerging um, space for debate, which is evolving and it has to evolve, and, and uh, uh, is almost like the the voice of the conscience of architecture, right? I mean, you're addressing issues that everyone's overlooking, um, and I just wanted to maybe to, to, to you to kind of to, what your thoughts on that, that, that really the role of IAC has to be to to try and um, improve uh, architecture education a bit like Uber and taxis. <laughs> well, this I, I I could put a title on on your um, uh, on your comments, Neil. Uh, the life and death of IAC. No, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, yeah. Um, well, first of all, it is true that IAC is a very very uh, young institution. It's only 21 years old. Uh, and of course, it is. Um, um, I hope uh, you know, like uh, positioned um, next to schools that they have a history of 200 or even more years. Um, and in this sense, I think that this is a symbol of of um, of an audience, uh, both student audience, but also you know, like a, a discipline audience that they need something different in terms of how teaching is happening, right? So um, um, IAC has been uh, basically founded in 2000, um, 2000 2001 um, with the goal to um, uh, envision uh, how the digital uh, revolution would affect architecture. It was a moment that very few people were talking about this. We were in Barcelona. Barcelona itself as a city didn't have this conversation anyways. I remember that in 2000, uh, um, I mean, in, in 2007 or five, we have created in collaboration with MIT an installation inside the Venice Biennale um, um, that uh, we, we created objects like uh, using um, what we could call today the Internet of Things, but the Internet of Things at that moment was not existing. No, so we were calling it the, the Internet Zero, which was a, a um, um, the name that Neil Gersenfeld from the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms gave to the installation. So uh, um, in 2009, we did a huge exhibition about 3D printing and construction, where very, very, very few people were talking about that. So it is true that in a way, 
What we're trying uh, from IAG is to foresee, you know, like um, what is uh, happening and what will happen in the future. But we want to do that with a critical view, because as I was saying before, technologies are fantastic, but they serve nothing unless we know the appropriate questions to make to technology. No, otherwise there is no solution that could be given. And then technologies can also be very, very critical and, and create like huge risks of uh, you know um, um, no inclusion of of uh, uh, no democratization of no openness so there are a lot of risks related to that so um, we have been always trying to see technologies as a medium uh, and 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 hack it or, or or use it in a way so that we can create uh, students we can create professionals we can create a, an, an an educational uh, let's say platform. Uh, for people that the most important thing is that they can go out there and feel um, ready to make a change because we need to make a change either in education or in the design or in the construction. No? So beyond a certain expertise on very, very small thing of how you program a robot or how you compute data, the most important, uh, let's say, um, uh, contribution that uh, IAC is doing and the most important work that we want to do is to change the mindsets of the people that they are part of IAC community. And, and this, is, this is something that is working because um, and the challenges are changing, um, the technologies are evolving. Uh, so being expert in one thing, it doesn't necessarily make you expert on it in a in, in few years time. So it's most important than the, the, the way of thinking and the mindset. Uh, it's most important to have a capacity of being able to be very radical in terms of how you think out of the box in certain solutions and how you create teams in order to develop these solutions rather than the technology in itself. No, And, and I think that um, um, uh, in terms of education, because uh, I also want to answer to the first part of, of your comments, um, you know that in many, many uh, times uh, that we have done these debates within Digital Futures and in other events about the future of education, I always support this idea of this distributed model of education, not only on an on online one, but also a making one, no? Uh, a distributed educational model that we could um, uh, have the possibility of different experts, of different cultures from different schools, but also of different uh, spaces uh, where uh, students or, or, or doctoral uh, candidates could um, uh, use for prototyping, for designing, for testing different ideas. And that could be a laboratory, that could be a, a laboratory of a school, that could be a city administration office, that could be a, um, um, an industry, that could be a, um, um, an association of neighborhoods community uh, office, no? So the spaces of that action needs to be thought beyond a traditional laboratory and, and the distributed model needs to be thought beyond, let's say, the, what, we are, what we, we are already doing online in the last year um, um, after the pandemic. Can I just maybe add a quick comment for passing back to them? Let's say it was kind of I was when you were talking about these things, it reminded me of, of um, Cedric Price, Cedric Price's famous comment: "No technology is the answer. What is the question?" And uh, it, it kind of, in some ways, and that I've, I'm kind of mindful because I've just given uh, conducted a course called the Hitchhiker's Guide to Artificial Intelligence, where it was based on Elon Musk's exactly the same kind of issue because the problem about that story hitchhiker's guide to the galaxies nobody knows what the question is we know what the answer is and i think that in some ways just to kind of respond in some way to philip i think in a way that's really what the role of theory has been and, and I, iac has always been a kind of dynamic space of of critical debate and to my mind theory is absolutely about asking questions it's it's not about adding an intellectual veneer to a kind of a, a, a formal language of architecture as some people take it it's more about asking questions and i think that's to some extent i think what what has has kept iac alive is the continual interrogation of it and the continual questioning of systems um uh, on the basis that if you ask questions, it's not critical. It's it, well, it's not destroying it. It's trying to improve the thing. And I think it seems to me that's the behind everything you're doing in terms of the technology is really a kind of a, a theoretical kind of uh, uh, agenda debate about what what should we be doing. It's it's the question which I think is really interesting about IAC and the questions you guys are asking. Great. I think uh, maybe that's um, feedback from the. Uh, the discussion in the past few days about um, 
the PhD program, and some of the students focus on the theoretical thinking, and some more focus on the technology-based uh, uh, research. And uh, this sequence actually we name it as a performance-based design. Actually, I find uh, not only um, uh, uh, IAC, but also including ICD, uh, ETH, and um, this kind of school, they have very similar approach approaches, uh, which is integrate um, uh, the, the, the process and the crossing different discipline and um, those the reviews information i think that's quite impressive and and followed by one of the uh, the question from the floor and asking um, the role of um, the um, the architect uh, in the future industry and the, the uh, he is asking about the role of the who is a creator and uh, architect if he is a creator or inventor or it's a poly, um, uh, policy maker or just problem solver. So how to define the, the future roles of uh, uh, architect? Would you like to, um, to ask a question on that? Yeah, maybe we can combine it with the next question of Gustavo that is talking about the role of architect as an entrepreneur, or I don't know, Gustavo, is it the same? Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, okay, he, he, he is the same. Gustavo uh, uh, is very, very much interested on the role of architect, and and uh, yeah, I, I am, I am also, I am also very much interested. I, I'm not sure I have the answer. I tried to give some answer, uh, some answers through our work, but um, the architect needs to be uh, a systems designer, and, and as a systems designer, needs to be within the protocols of different kinds of systems and different spaces, right? So um, I'm not sure how easy it is for an architect to be a decision maker, but I'm very, very sure that an architect needs to stand next to decision makers in, in, in many aspects, not only construction regulations, but also, you know, like urban planning regulations, um, um, circular economy thinking, sustainability goals, an architect needs to be next to that. I, I, I am sure that, um, um, of course, uh, as you are saying, that um, the architect uh, needs to also have a very, very powerful entrepreneurial, uh, let's say, um, um, value or, or capacity you know, in, in, uh, in, uh, in their operation, because um, much of what we need in architecture and in the built environment uh, today has not been invented yet. So this kind of entrepreneurial, uh, let's say, um, um, principle is fundamental because it allows to create businesses that they haven't existed before. Uh, it allows to create, uh, you know, like services that they weren't, uh, um, that they didn't exist before. And, and understanding that, um, understanding that in education, it also means that, you know, architectural education needs to not only prepare people that they are able to design perfectly and create the, the very perfect construction detail and, and, and draw plans and, and print plans and follow plans in executions, in execution, uh, but more than anything to, you know, question as Neil was saying before, and, and to provide new uh, businesses, provide new services, that they can answer uh, these questions, uh, at least part of these questions. So yeah, I am with you that uh, uh, the role of architect is a multi, multi-layered, let's say, um, maestro of an orchestra uh, of a lot of complex, let's say, uh, disciplines and and and, and uh, actions. Okay, interesting. Maybe we can follow up to integrate another prop, another question. Um, the question is about um, the energy saving of the new. Sometimes when we get uh, some new ideas and put forward some question to uh, critically uh, uh, make a different solution on the tradition and uh, construction technology, uh, we we should uh, uh, measure the new technology to the, the energy saving and the budget such kind of issues. So uh, uh, maybe this question goes to the innovation, the meaning of innovation. Maybe that's not only put forward a question, but also we need to, uh, uh, to engage this new technology into the, the scenarios of the problem solving process. 
Would you like to um, answer the question? Um, um, I don't see that question. Where is it, Philip? Is it in the chat? Or is it your uh, question? Uh, I can paste it, maybe. Uh, uh, yeah, no, it. it's, it's okay. I, I, um, just, I was just wondering where, where it comes from. Mm -hmm. um, energy is only one of the resources that architecture needs to integrate uh, in its performance and its operation. It's not the only one. Water is fundamental. Food, food is another resource that we need to somehow integrate into our um, urban infrastructure the same way as we have uh, streets and highways. Um, uh, together with uh, um, my colleague and, and very good friend, uh, Lydia Kalipoliti and, and with um, Ivan Sergeyev, we have been actually appointed as head curators of the next Tallinn uh, Biennale, Tallinn Biennale of Architecture. And our topic is around um, um, the, the issue of food and, and how that we can question, you know, like the long uh, transportation of products that they come in cities, how we can enhance new ways of, of localization and production and distributing distribution. Um, so um, energy, definitely uh, water, food, as well as um, innovation and technology and knowledge. The fact that, um, you know, the fact that the, the Suarez, uh, um, uh, channel was was uh, collapsed and the transportation in, in in the global scale was collapsed because you know like we couldn't ship things i think that is a model that definitely uh doesn't uh, seem to be the appropriate one for the close future and during this pandemic we have seen that because for the first time we have asked ourselves so intensively where uh, does our resources come from? No, where do they come from? Where does our food come from? Why the shelves of the supermarket are empty? Um, um, uh, where does our material come? You know, and and I think that the fact that uh, um, in a way um, cities need to be much more uh, focused in the productivity section, not only in terms of resources such as energy, food, or water, and but also in terms of knowledge and skills and crafts and technologies, right? I think that this is uh, something that um, at the moment, uh, uh, especially the European part uh, of the world that has not been so advanced in, in producing certain technologies or, 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 or certain processes uh, and products, they are now having a look of how um, um, other parts of the world, such as China or US have been dealing with that. And I think that um, it is something that is going to be changing and architecture needs to integrate it to, into the operation. Good. Gustavo, would you like to um, ask questions? Are you here? No? There's, there's also a question um, in the chat there from um, oh, yeah. uh, Sina Mustavavi. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Philip, I posted a few questions on the chat, uh -huh. but uh, Sina's question seems good. Mm -hmm. So the question to three of us, um, what do you look for in a PhD student? So that's, that's an interesting question. Maybe Arati would like to ask, how um, do you find your PhD student and what's your measurement uh, and criteria for your students? Um, the first thing I say, what we look at is, is very flexible and multifaceted profiles. Uh, mainly following what we have been discussing until now, the fact that, you know, like the research now needs to be multidisciplinary and therefore expertise only in one thing uh, uh, is not uh, the best uh, the best skill today, in my opinion. Uh, so that um, um, multifaceted, let's say, nature of researchers, uh, that they're able to understand, uh, to, to have a deep understanding of different uh, fields and, and of course different skills um, is something that we are we're searching for. Uh, we are searching for PhD candidates that they have um, the ability to, to provoke uh, with their work, because as I was saying, we need to have these radical changes. So um, that kind of, of, of people are very, very interesting to us. Um, and of course, you know, like um, um, the, the, the ability and the vision to look beyond uh, um, what architecture have traditionally been serving, 
and, and, and open up, uh, yeah, you have visions of how architecture could eventually um, change a lot of different systems that they don't operate appropriately today. And a question followed by that one. Um, could you see the chat? Mm. So we mentioned in the code, the architects can be the authors of system. And as you show, uh, these system could be designed to a uh, similar production system. So the system is the product of design in such a model to which extent do you think architecture will be a service oriented discipline and to which extent product oriented? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, actually. Um, well, it depends on how uh, do you define product and service. I think that uh, one of the most important thing in, in this um, um, circular design or the materializing circular design uh, um, action, I mean, there are a lot, of, a lot of different actions related to that. Uh, you definitely need um, a strategy. And a strategy, it's not a product, and it's not, uh, I mean, it could be designed, but it's not a design product, no? It's not a service either. And I'm saying that because uh, you, um, I mean, um, within uh, the, the new paradigm of, of uh, circular uh, design um, in, in architecture, as I was saying at some part of my presentation, there are certain infrastructures necessary that um, uh, it's not in the power of, of, of architects to, to happen, no? Uh, we need to have certain um, uh, infrastructure in relation to, uh, to circular hubs. We need to have, you know, like uh, um, um, communities and citizens that they are able uh, to understand how they need to change also their behaviors because the problem is not a problem of the top. The problem is both top and bottom, no? Like we need, each one of us needs to change mindsets um, in how we can work on that. I, I need to, to be able to educate citizens on, on what they can do with their organic waste. What is the power of their, of their, of their uh, rabbits, no? Uh, uh, um, and, and, and of course, um, what is the possibilities in terms of uh, saving energies? Uh, what are the possibilities if we think of um, circularity, not necessarily as a product, which is also uh, important, but also as a kind of a, of a new way of managing space, no? Uh, think about, I don't know, think about blockchain technologies and, and this possibility of, of uh, no transparent transactions uh, among communities. Think on the fact that we can have architecture that generates energy in the neighborhood, but then who owns that energy becomes the biggest problem rather than how do we generate energy in our buildings. So the fact that, you know, this circularity should be also open to the communities uh, and management of resources that it is much more local, transparent, and, 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 and not by, um, by few, but distributed to many, um, is something that we will definitely um, um, need to develop. So in that sense, um, I think that it's not only, I mean, products and services are very, very fundamental, but we also need to have, um, uh, on the one hand, support from uh, certain, um, um, uh, let's say, uh, decisions that is being taken and then be, uh, open to create strategies and protocols that uh, people could learn from. Great. Um, thanks a lot to Arati and to sharing um, your research and your teaching and uh, what you're doing in the past few years. I think it's a great experience uh, for, for us. I think um, um, it's very exciting uh, to have you here and looking forward in the future, um, uh, Iraq, uh, Iraq and uh, Arati can give more support to the future platform. So that's a great thanks to um, uh, your lecture. And the um, time is almost up. Yeah. Uh, and thanks a lot uh, to, to, your, to your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank Neil, you very much for the invite. Uh, good luck to the doctoral students with the work that they are doing. And please free to contact me or, or my team because the work that I have shown today is an outcome of a huge, amazing and brilliant multidisciplinary team. Feel free uh, to contact us um, um, in this kind of, of you know, like distributed way of sharing knowledge. We would be glad to help you. 
Yeah, maybe for just a final comment. I, I, I thought it was kind of interesting when Aretti was describing, I mean, referring to Gordon Pask and things, I thought that was an interesting kind of comment to say that, you know, in a sense, we are kind of becoming increasingly systems designers. And I'm kind of was struck by the, I mean, I'm always struck by the way that the term architect, if you Google it these days, you, you've got to kind of cross computer science and, and the term that's used within computer science. And it seems to me maybe there's, there is something there to be, to be um, to be looked at because I think what I mean I what I always think is in terms of an architecture education is is that it, you, we actually have a lot of a lot of uh, we're trained in in in, a, in a, an air, in many areas where we could redeploy that education you know I think it's actually a, we focus only on the construction industry but actually we have a lot of skills to do with uh, uh, thinking in terms of systems in a very structural way that I don't think many others do actually so it, it does strike me that kind of like in the end we are kind of systems thinkers and 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 trying to sort of coordinate all these things together and uh, I think just to say further I, I you know I think that that uh, the 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 discussions about education that we've been having and sharing and, and thank you so much over over the the years already but I think you know we're, we're, it's an ongoing question and we need to st keep interrogating it and I hopefully this initiative which seemed to be the kind of the, the next step in some ways can provide some platform for um you know really interrogating how how we can rethink education i i guess i'm a, a two words that i would always always look at is one of uh, philip and i everything we do is always about the future you know and i think that's that's something that we absolutely have to address and and frankly you know in in most architectural education we look to the past we do courses in history but we've got to really think about the future because everything in architecture is premised on the future and the second one is is the notion of rethinking which is i have a book called rethinking architecture but it's absolutely what we have to do we have to do it the whole time you have to keep rethinking and rethinking about the future so that's what i really like about the 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 yeah, initiative is that you do that you're continually asking things and taking risks at the same time and, and it's uh, it's interesting to know to see how popular iac has become amid the men, the huge marketplace of master but that you guys have, are still pursuing the important questions and and, and really asking well you you're asking the important questions so uh thank you I, I, that, I that is lovely and yeah let's let's continue the discussion of of what we could do how we can contribute all together as a community of educators for a more accessible education i really really enjoy the inclusive future initiative i think it's fundamental to be able to offer uh you know like a space for debate and 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 for knowledge to 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 all uh, education is a right uh, and and um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to our further discussion on on uh, system, on complex systems, on on uh, system designers, and and all the um, all the relevant questions around it. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Have Thank a good you. night. Bye -bye. I know it's late it's in that part of the world. <laughs> bye, -bye. Bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao.